baby joke for you. A man calls the doctor and says, quick, my pregnant wife's going into labor. What should I do? And the doctor said, is this her first child? And the man says, no, this is her husband. Draw your family tree. Okay, um, open up to the teacher lesson, notes from the teacher lesson for chapter five. Uh, one thing I want to tell you, um, to advise you on, to exhort you in, is please do not, do not write on my tables. Uh, because uh, Terry, our sweet um, custodian, cleans 70,000 square feet of this place every day. And when you write on the tables, you force her to spend some of that time cleaning up after you. Uh, by the way, if you ever have a question, I hope you don't. But that's one of the things Terry will have you do, is clean up the tables. You don't find out that it's not fun. So, uh, please don't write on the tickets. Uh, okay. So you're sort of curious. I mean, action in my life. <laughs> okay. It wasn't curious enough. <laughs> uh, that's fine. Yeah, I'm curious about what you were not curious about, but whatever. Uh, okay. This is a true story. In 1952, Maury Bernstein hypnotized Virginia Ty of Pe Pe Pueblo, Cal uh, Colorado. Under hypnosis, Ty told of a past life. She had many details, claiming that she had been Bridie Murphy from Ireland. Her story spread rapidly across America and helped popularize the theory of reincarnation, the belief that we have lived before as another person or animal. Thus, someone here might have been Bloody Mary, or Napoleon, or Nero, or Hitler. Why don't they say any nice people? You could have been Paul. Who knows if there was such a thing, but there's not. However, the story didn't end there. It was later discovered that Virginia Ty had a neighbor across the street. Her name was Bridie Murphy Corkle from Ireland. So uh, Virginia had faked the whole thing, the whole story. Theologians use a similar term. They use the term incarnation. That is not the same thing as reincarnation. Incarnation means to incarnate or uh, to um, become flesh. Carne means flesh, uh, and so it means to be made flesh. Reincarnation means to place in the human form again. So those people who believe in reincarnation believe that you live a life, you die, and then you become a person, you become in flesh again as someone else. Uh, the Bible speaks nowhere of reincarnation. In fact, it speaks against it in Hebrews when the author of Hebrews says it is appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. So uh, there is no such thing as reincarnation. Uh, but it does speak of incarnation. Uh, the the, the uh, incarnation means to put something in fleshly form for the first time. And that is what happened at Bethlehem. Uh, God came to earth as a baby. He was made flesh. He became flesh for the first time. So um, I think I'm going to read for you this whole thing, and then we'll continue. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Un uh, John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So no one has ever seen God, the only God, meaning Jesus, who is at the Father's side. Jesus has made God the Father known. So theologically speaking, when the divine Christ became human in the fleshly sense, the incarnation occurred. That is what we celebrate at Christmas, the incarnation of God. Not presents, not Santa, not lights, not the tree, not all of that stuff. I'm not saying any of that is bad. I'm saying that's not what Christmas is about. This is what Christmas is about. 
So um, when verse 14 says that the word became flesh, it means that Christ became flesh. Um, in the beginning, uh, in the beginning of John, it says, "In the beginning was the Word, was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him." This word "became" is means something different. God did not make Him flesh; He became flesh. Now, why is that important to know? Because if He had been made flesh, that could have been the beginning of His existence but he became flesh, which tells us that he existed before that. He became flesh. I was a stay-at-home mom, and I became a teacher. Um, so I, was, I, was, I existed before that. I had an existence before that. I was a mom, uh, but I became a teacher. So it shows his pre-existence. Uh, he was spirit and became flesh. So God, who is spirit, had never been flesh before this. This was the first time, the only time. The word became flesh. Uh, so Jesus was not uh, just any little baby in Bethlehem. He was God in the flesh. He was God incarnate. Now, had God appeared in human form before Christ was born in Bethlehem? Yes. Uh, are there any examples from the Old Testament, Ben? Uh, when they wrestled with Jacob. Okay, so uh, Jacob wrestled with an angel. Some people think it was an angel. Some people think it was the pre-incarnate Christ. But he wrestled with someone. Any other examples? Yeah. Didn't he walk with Abraham to make a covenant with him? So the, Abraham had a visitor, right? And some people think that was the pre-incarnate Christ. What else? So when Moses was on the mountain, and he says, I want to see you, and God says, yeah, you can't do that in the lift. So I'm going to put you in a rock, uh, in, the, in this cleft of a rock, and, and I'm going to pass behind you. My glory is going to pass behind you. That's the burning bush would be another one. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Somebody was in the fire with them. Some people think it was an angel. Some people think it was the pre-incarnate Christ, the pre-existent Christ. Um, so how is... This, how is the incarnation different than this? Um, those other things are called a theophany. I'm not going to write it up there because it's about to come up on the screen. But a theophany is an appearance of God in physical form, but not literal form, not, not fleshly, not with a fleshly body. So, uh, the meaning of the incarnation is not, it was in fleshly form, was not a theophany. Was not a theophany. He was God in the flesh, literal flesh. He had, he had flesh and bones. Those things that we just talked about, and there are many more of them, were theophanies. Um, that uh, 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 God appearing invisible but not physical fleshly form so in Bethlehem however Christ actually became a human being uh, God actually became a human being uh, and when uh, uh, when he became he became what he was not before so he was spirit before he became flesh but he never ceased to be all that he already was this is what we talk about um, the doctrine that he was fully man and fully God at the same time. So Jesus, while walking on earth, was completely human, just like you are human, just like I am human, he was human. He was different in that at the same time, he was fully God. So he became what he was not before, but he never ceased to be all that he was before. He did not cease to be God, um, even though he was in the flesh. Um, he dwelt among us. 
Now, all except for one point on this, I'm gonna go through quickly. One point of this I think is important. I'm not saying that what we're about to talk about, what we're gonna talk about uh, here uh, is the tabernacle. So um, I'm not saying it's incorrect. I'm just saying it's not that important, and I don't think it's what either the authors of Moses, um, of the description of the tabernacle was talking about, nor what the point is of who Jesus is. But one thing is, one thing's important, so that probably doesn't make any sense to you because I haven't said it yet. But I'm just telling you I'm gonna fly through it quickly. But first of all, who had Mrs. Binko in fourth grade? Okay, tell me something about the tabernacle, Carissa. Oh, <laughs> Somebody else, tell me something about the tabernacle. Everybody's excited to have Mrs. Bingo. You know what my son said to me late? You know what he said? I wish I would have had Mrs. Bingo in fourth grade. Who was his fourth grade teacher? This is me. I was his fourth He told me that. He wanted, I, I'm like, I wanted Mrs. Bingo for my fourth grade. Who doesn't want Mrs. Bingo for me? You guys you should be so sad you were here for fourth grade and had Mrs. Bingo. She's amazing. Um, so what did you learn about the tabernacle? Or what do you know about the tabernacle? Oh, I don't know. The place that was like a camp. <laughs> okay, they camped around it. Who camped around it, by the way? The All Jews. Tribes. The Jews when? In the 400 40 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> a long time to wander. What was, what was that? Moses was my great, 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 great grandfather. Why are we still out here? So, uh, yeah, they, they camped around the tabernacle uh, during their 40 years of wandering in the desert. What else about the tabernacle? Yeah. Like the Holy of okay, the Holy of Holies was inside of that, the most holy place, the place where God's presence dwelt. What else? Holy. That's all you got? Wow. Don't tell Mrs. Bingo, yeah. Didn't they like make bread every day? And they did, they did. But more, I'm more concerned about, it. it was a tent. I don't know if it looked like this. This is a reenactment, obviously. This is not a picture of the actual tabernacle. Um, but it was a, a tent, a traveling tent. So as they were wandering in the desert, they'd get to a new place, they'd set up the tabernacle, they'd camp around it on the outside. The 12, each of the 12 tribes had their own place. And, uh, and then when they got ready to leave, they'd pack it up and they'd, carry it away and they take it to the next place. So it was a traveling tent um, and uh, it was um, a, so I'm gonna give you several things about it. Inside, the temple was patterned after this. So the outside was the outer court and then inside the tent you had the inner court, uh, which was where the sacrifices were made and where there was, or actually the outer court was where the sacrifices were made in this case. But that's where the bread was, that's where the lamp stands were, that's where all that stuff was. And then on the inner, uh, court, there was um, the holies of Hol the holy of holies, the most holy place where the ark of the covenant was. That was the only thing in there, and where the where the presence of God dwelt. So um, let's talk about this. We're going to compare the tabernacle to Christ. A couple of them, uh, most of them, we're going to do really quickly. The tabernacle was temporary. It was only for their time in the desert. It did exist after the time in the desert. So. It was made after they started wandering, so sometime between 35 and 40 years that they had the tabernacle wandering. But it was also set up in Jerusalem until the temple was built, and it was there for quite some time. So uh, it was a temporary place, just as, as Christ's time on earth was temporary. It was uh, for 30 some odd years. Um, secondly, it was unattractive. Okay, here's the problem with this. I'm gonna read Isaiah 53. It was outwardly unattractive. So many pictures. From Isaiah 53, this is a prophecy of Jesus. This is a prophecy of Jesus. Uh, well, it's a pro prophecy of Messiah, and Jesus is Messiah, so it's a prophecy of Jesus. For he grew up before him, before God, like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. That's not saying he was ugly, but it is saying this. You know the paintings that we see of Jesus, and he's glowing, and he's got the halo, and he's, you know, this beautiful white man with long brown hair? Ain't Jesus. That's not what he looked like. He looked like an ordinary Jew. This is what it's talking about. He looked like any other Jew of his day. He didn't stand out. He didn't have an aura. He didn't have a halo. He was dark-skinned. 
He had dark hair, probably curly, maybe a big nose. That was kind of common too. Uh, who knows? I, 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 I'll recognize him when I see him, but I don't know what he looks like. Uh, and so uh, he, ha he looked like an or ordinary Jew. That doesn't mean he was ugly. I, I, don't, I don't like that part. Okay. Uh, the tabernacle, well, tabernacle was the dwelling place of God. And when Jesus was on earth, he was the dwelling place of God on earth. He was God in the flesh. Uh, and then this is the one that's important. That's a reenactment of the um, Ark of the Covenant and the thing ahead and above it is called the mercy seat of God and that was where his presence dwelled. So if you touch that, you die. Yeah. Uh, and it is where God met man. This is the important part. Now, they have this whole drawing here that I took out because it didn't make any sense to me at all. This is what makes sense to me. I did this for you last year. Uh, if you remember it, I'm sorry. Just well, no, I'm not sorry. I'm glad you remember. It. Um, but just live with it again and listen again because it's. I think it bears repeating. So uh, this is sinful human. <laughs> this is our holy God. How's it trying? Trinity. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so there is no way on our own that we can get from here to here because God is perfect and we are not and we can't make ourselves perfect. So we've got a problem. We've got a problem that we can't solve ourselves. Let's say by way of illustration that I take you on a field trip to the Grand Canyon. Yes. And while we're there, I have a great idea. Let's all try to jump. long jump across the Grand Canyon. Yes. Oh. And I'll go first. Oh. So I take a running start. <laughs> and I jump as far as I can, which is right along the edge of it. And I end up at the bottom of the canyon. Now, Elijah here is a pretty good athlete. I'm sure he can do better than I can. So, and he's also, of course, very concerned about me. So he says, I'm going to go next. And he goes flying by and he jumps. Uh, how do I get that far? Elijah, where do we both end up? In the ground. At the bottom of the Grand Canyon yeah. because we literally cannot do it. And you gave. We literally, not in game. <laughs> Gabe, here's Gabe. <gasps> Whoa! <laughs> That's it. That's Gabe. Uh, we literally cannot do it. We are broken and we cannot fix ourselves. We cannot do it. So God did what only God could do because you see God loves us and he wants to be with us. But he can't be because of sin. And so he came down in the form of Jesus Christ and died on a cross and rose from the dead and rose from the dead so that we might have a way to live with God forever. It is the only way. It is the only way it would have worked. God is both, he's perfectly a lot of things, but is God perfectly loving? Yes, he is. Is he perfectly just? Yes, he is. Because he loves us, he wants to be with us. But could he say, oh, just let them all in. I want them. I want them to be with me. Just come on. Come on. No, he's not your grandpa. He's not your grandma. My grandkids do stuff all the time. And I'm like, it's fine. And the parents are pulling their hair out. I'm like, mom, or I'll laugh. That's not funny, mom. No, it's hilarious. Um, so, uh, yeah, he can't do that. Why? Why can't he just say, let them all in? Because he's perfectly just as well. Could God say, just send them all what we deserve but he loves us and he doesn't want that um, because he's both perfectly loving and perfectly just now we do deserve that but let's say um, a, a judge said to a murderer you know what this is the first time you've ever murdered you've never been in trouble before let's, I'll just let you go 
what would be the people's reaction? No, that's not just. You just let us all in is not just. But to send us all to hell, that would that would contradict well, it would be just. But it wouldn't be wrong. So God answered the or solved the issue the only way that it could be solved. He did it for us. It's much like when my children were little and they couldn't tie their shoes. And I didn't sit there and go, come on, come on, come on, you're two. Right, get them done. We gotta go. We're making church. No, I didn't do that. What did I do? I bent down and I tied their shoes for them because they couldn't. God came down to die on the cross and rise again so that we could live in relationship with Him. Now, not everyone takes them up on that deal, but it's available to Him. Uh, and He um, He did it for us. So. Um, Acts 4.12 says um, there is salvation in no one else. There is no one, uh, there is no other name under heaven uh, by which we must be saved. There is only Christ. This is the only way. And it is the only way because it is the only way that Christ, God's love and his justice can be satisfied. This is what 2 Timothy says. Or First Timothy, excuse me, two five six. Uh, it says this: For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave Himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at a proper time. We have one mediator. We have one way to Christ. We have one way over this chasm, and it's the cross and the empty tomb. It's Jesus. Um, so it was at the center of Israel's camp. Uh, it's the last one just as Christ is to be the center of our lives. Uh, so we'll move on. We're going to talk about the purpose of the incarnation, the purpose of the incarnation. Uh, and this is what it says in uh, verses 14 through 18 again. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I'm going to read through parts of this a lot because I want to, I want to make sure you hear this. I want to make sure you understand it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, Jesus, who is at the Father's side. He, Jesus, has made God the Father known. And, and John, or Jesus said a number of times in the Gospel of John, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Um, so he revealed the nature of God. He made God known, in other words, is what it says in verse 18. Um, and, and that word, word, the, and the word became flesh, the logos, the expression of God became flesh and revealed his grace and truth to us. Uh, and so that's the next thing. Uh, he First to reveal the nature of God and secondly to reveal the grace of God. So first he revealed the nature of God and, and it tells us that in 118 and then the grace of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me reigns before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness, from the fullness of Christ, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So he came to reveal the grace of God. Um, he came to reveal God. Uh, the nature of God and the grace of God. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Um, now, we talk about these two words, grace and mercy, and he, he reveals both the grace of God and, and the mercy of God, and sometimes people use them interchangeably. They are, they are connected, but they're not interchangeable. So I want you to write down the definitions of mercy and grace. What is mercy? Anybody know what a definition of mercy is? Yeah. Not giving us what we deserve. Yeah. Not giving us what we deserve when we deserve a bad thing. So let's put it this way. Not giving us the bad 
that we deserve. So God in his mercy does not send us to hell. Send everyone to hell. That's mercy. Do we deserve it? Yes. But he doesn't give it to us. That's mercy. Not giving us the bad that we deserve. Grace is giving us the good we don't deserve. Do we deserve heaven? We do not. But he, he gives us heaven because of his son. God, grace is giving us, giving the good, giving us the good we don't deserve. Now in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is a lot about law, but we do see God's grace and mercy in the Old Testament as well. Can you think of any examples from the Old Testament of God's grace and mercy? Yeah. Delivering the Israelites from the Egyptians. Delivering the Israelites from the Egyptians. That's absolutely what else. Yeah. He didn't destroy. He didn't destroy them. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Giving them manna in the wilderness. Yes. So providing for them in the wilderness. Yeah. But not just killing mankind after they sin the first time. Yeah, not just killing Adam and Eve. Or what about Noah Noah and his family? They were sinful too. But he saved them. He showed um, mercy and grace on them. Um, so Jesus, excuse me, God didn't have to send Jesus. But because he loved us, uh, he did. Uh, and uh, that reveals his love and his grace to us. Uh, so mercy is not giving us what we deserve. Grace is giving us, not giving us the, uh, the bad we do deserve, and, and grace is giving us the good that we don't deserve. Uh, and then it also, he also revealed the truth of God. that Jesus came to reveal. But one of the truths is that we're sinful. In fact, the purpose of the law was to show us that we can't do it, to show us that we're sinful, that we can't be perfect, we can't make our own way to God, or a purpose of the law was that. Uh, and so um, to show us that we're sinful and, and that God hates sin. God cannot abide with sin, and it must be punished. Now, we get that when it's someone else. But Christ chose to take on that punishment. Punishment. That's how much he loved us. I don't know if any of y'all have ever said, uh, I'll take the punishment of my brother or sister. No, it's like, you did that, Eric. You get spanking, not me, right? Yeah, I'm not taking that. Um, but, and you're, you're a sweetheart, but no, no, Eric got in trouble. I'm sure Eric got in trouble once or twice, at least. And so he gets the punishment. Um, so um, uh, he loved us, but, but we deserved to be punished. And God just can't overlook that. Again, he's not your grandparent. He can't just go, you know, well, I'll just, I'll just won't notice that one. Is that just? Say, I'll just overlook that. Again, we get it when it's someone else. Um, sin has to be punished. And that's a dilemma because God loves us and wants to be with us. By the way, there is such a thing as righteous anger. Um, Paul says, be angry, but do not sin. So there is an anger. Now, righteous anger is not selfish. So when you're angry at someone for cutting you off in traffic, that's not righteous anger. Yes, they did something wrong. But you're, that's selfish anger, right? But I want to get where I'm going to. You're just as selfish as they are, right? Uh, just in a different way. Um, but if they 
things like child abuse or human trafficking of, of anyone, but particularly children, if that doesn't make you angry, something's wrong. Because there's things that God says that he's angry about. And, and there are some things that are worth getting angry about. But he loved us, and he wanted to be with us forever. Uh, at the same time, he has to be perfectly just because he is. So uh, there's only one answer to our problem, and that answer is the cross of Christ. Um, we will pick up here uh, tomorrow, because we're already ahead of where we were for last hour. Um, we've got a few minutes, and we've got about five minutes.